What should climbers eat? This is a question that I have spent several years thinking about, primarily for the sake of my own performance and health, but also for climbers in general. I'm an all-round climber in so much as that I participate in several climbing disciplines at the same time to as high a level as I can. Being an all-rounder in anything presents some challenges for how to balance trade-offs and skills and attributes. I've learned that like everything to do with training and performance, different approaches to nutrition in climbing also have some trade-offs depending on what type of genetics you've inherited from your parents, how you've developed or damaged your body through your life, and what kind of climbing you're doing. Over time, I will share with you everything that I've learned about nutrition through a mix of reading, the research literature in my own time, formal study of nutrition, and my own personal experiments. It's a big subject and it won't come in one episode. Many of you write to me every day to ask me to discuss my approach to nutrition in detail because you know enough about me to know that I've put a lot of effort into examining this aspect. Many of you have also noted an apparent reticence to discuss it. That's true, I am reticent about it. All I can say is that that will not be forever and I will explain why I am reticent. I would say that I'm reticent about discussing nutrition for three reasons which also serve as the main points I want to make in this episode. Firstly, basic diligence. After experimenting with quite radically different approaches to nutrition for both health and sport, I've been forced to abandon some of the notions that I had in the past about what constitutes a healthy diet for a human and an optimal diet for my sport performance. When your beliefs are challenged in such a way that you're forced to reframe them completely, it makes everything a little less certain. Although I feel I've learned a lot in the past five years, I'm more acutely aware than ever before of everything that I've yet to learn as well as the fact that there may be more things that I have to yet unlearn. Therefore, I tend to lean towards testing and retesting the ideas more than I ever did before. I've learned enough to observe some really smart people who I respect a lot, drawing confident conclusions about nutrition from weak data and potentially reaching the wrong answer, or at least not seeing other contexts in which a different conclusion might be valid. On the flip side, I'm constantly reminded of one of my favourite articles by a scientist, a famous speech in 1965 by Austin Bradford Hill, in which he was discussing the aspects of scientific data which are most important for inferring causation. He recognised the weakness, if not inadequacy, of the scientific data we have access to, and yet concluded, all scientific work is incomplete, whether it be observational or experimental. All scientific work is liable to be upset or modified by advancing knowledge. That does not confer upon us a freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone an action that it appears to demand at a given time. I first read that piece as an undergraduate student and I've kept it in mind ever since. It's especially useful when applying as scientific an approach as we can to our own sport performance. Despite the uncertainties, we have to decide how to train and what to eat today. And if we adopt an approach and then decide that it isn't optimal, we can just change it. With that said, my feeling in observing the way fashions shift and change in training and nutrition is that these uncertainties are quite often glossed over and as such it's easy to overshoot and reach beyond the data. For example, high fat diets are not appropriate for sport or on the other side carbs are bad. <laughs> Neither of those statements are true. Our current world of social media is optimised around posting first and double checking things later. This has its value, but it has obvious downsides. There, there's also the tendency of social media to accelerate your confirmation bias and make you feel that an approach to training and performance is more popular and has stronger data behind it than it actually does. There are some things in nutrition I am confident about, and I'll share one of them with you now. I do feel that just as with training, in nutrition, there's, all, there's often several different ways to reach the same place. Which method or approach you choose will depend on your preferences and other individual factors. I think it's fair to say that human gut morphology and metabolism is well adapted to certain core aspects of diet. I do believe at this point that there are diets that are likely to be easier to maintain than others, uh, uh, you know, easier to maintain a, an optimal state of health and performance as consistently as possible. However, it's also fair to say that a key aspect of human physiology is our adaptability. We can use this adaptability to our advantage in sport performance to match diet and training requirements and work with or around your cultural preferences. However, that adaptability has its limits, especially when our physiological state is altered in some way, such as by disease or trauma or even just by age. For people affected by these states, the rules might be somewhat different. 
To draw this back to something more practical, what I'm saying here is that if you want to eat a certain way, you more than likely can, can do that and make it work. But it may be that one approach will take more attention to detail, less room for error without running into problems, and it may not work as well for as long before your performance and health start to drop off. I would also like to say that I think mixing and matching the best of different approaches to both training and nutrition is underrated in general. This is almost certainly exacerbated by the polarisation into camps that tends to happen on social media. Most, if not all, dietary approaches have both strengths and weaknesses, and pointing out their weaknesses can be quite easy online, but it might be a more useful approach instead to think, what can we learn from this approach? As I say, I'll go through the details of my own experiences and reading of the research on this channel as we go on. Right now, I still have some things I'd like to answer for myself, and there are some studies that I'd like to see done and where it's unrealistic to expect to see them done. I'll keep experimenting on myself. But one thing I'd also like to take an opportunity to do right now is to try and answer some research questions myself. <laughs> I had hoped to do a really interesting lab-based trial around different types of fat and effects on appetite, but with what's happening in 2020, that's all been cancelled. Instead, I'm going to run a study online and I'm going to ask the question, what do climbers currently eat? There is a quote in my book Make or Break that says, make your next move from where you actually are. An important step in assessing how the diet and nutrition of climbers might be improved is to establish what we as a sport currently eat. A couple of small studies have looked at this, but mainly in the sport climbing discipline. Climbing obviously involves a wide spectrum of disciplines and therefore the nutritional needs of those are likely to reflect that. We don't currently know how the diets of climbers differ at different performance levels and across the different disciplines. It would definitely be useful to know if there are differences. We also don't know if there are differences between climbers active in the competition scene and those who push their climbing but don't compete. Attitudes to eating, body composition and dietary approaches are also an interesting area and we don't know what dietary patterns are prevalent across our sport at present. If you're a climber who follows a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, paleo, ketogenic diet, it would be interesting to know how widely these strategies are adopted across the sport. Judging by the media, social media, it seems that these approaches are all gaining popularity, but we, and until this is measured, we just don't know. If we know more about what's being currently done, we can move forward to identify areas for improvement that will benefit the health and the performance of climbers. Therefore, I'm going to survey the dietary patterns of climbers across different disciplines. However, in order to do that, I need to ask you for your help. I've constructed a questionnaire online, which I would be extremely grateful if you would complete for me. It's online now at the link below and it'll be live for about a week. The form will take you around 30 minutes to complete. It's completely anonymous and there's no way that I can identify you from your data. It's got two sections. The first asks you about your climbing habits, your dietary patterns and your attitudes to eating and body composition. The second part is a standard research tool to assess the foods that you habitually eat. It's not the most exciting thing in the world to fill out, but it is straightforward. Your help would not only greatly benefit me to complete the research, but also potentially the whole sport to have good data to work with. The full details of the study and the data management are on the first page of the questionnaire at the link below. I'd like you to participate if you either climb or do any sort of training related to your climbing three times a week or more and are over 16 years old. Essentially, I'm just looking to include anyone who climbs regularly at any level. It's also important that I can gather responses from climbers who participate in the full range of rock climbing disciplines from competition bouldering right through to big walls. There's so little research in some of these disciplines and it'd be great to gather some more data from them. If enough of you respond and I have data to work with, of course I will share and discuss the results with you in due course. And thank you so much for your time and help to contribute your data. I'm really looking forward to seeing the patterns in the data and sharing them with you. I'm also about to post another short video to accompany the research questionnaire, just going through the detail of the form to make it as easy as possible for you to complete. And I'll finish this post by saying that after this stage is complete, I'll have more time to discuss with you some of my own dietary experiments, which have definitely been fun and definitely been quite surprising. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next video.